Hi, I'm James Dunn. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In Depth, and my guest today is Christine Todd, Senior Managing Director and Head of Fixed Income US at Amundi Pioneer Asset Management. Hello, Christine. Hello, thank you. Could you give us just a bit more of a snapshot of the insurance linked notes business? Because it, it, it sounds like it's a, a kind of a, an, an uncorrelated return source. And in that sort of uh, market with, with people always looking for the holy grail of, of uncorrelated return, what, what kind of um, benefits and, and, and dangers does that asset class offer? Well, you're looking at a literally a zero correlation of insurance linked notes returns with U.S. equities, U.S. aggregate, U.S. corporate. So that in and of itself is incredibly compelling. As well, you're getting a very attractive net yield. Somewhere between seven and a half and 10% is our estimate for this year. Uh, and basically what this market is, is, um, by the way, it's been around for a long time. We've been managing ILS since 2008. So it's not a new market, even though it's small, as I said, 100 billion. Um, and these are securities that are traded in both public securities, public markets, as well as private placements, and as well as direct contracts. And essentially what you're doing is you're laying off insurance risk to the capital markets. And it, the risks here are not tied to the traditional fixed income risks, the economy, interest rates, corporate spread, politics, geopolitics, it's tied specifically to the risk to property of natural disasters, such as wind, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, winter storms, and fire. Now, we tend to avoid fire because we have very sophisticated models, but the models aren't predictive of that risk. So we're really emphasizing wind and earthquakes. Uh, two things that, that clients have raised in the process of allocating capital to our insurance link note strategy is one, is this going to be an increasingly poor performer because of climate change? And will there be more uh, policy coverage because the one in 100 year storm is happening you know, every year? And the data says no. Um, if you look at the um, years of experience of greater than $40 billion in loss, we have not had one since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And if you look at the, those losses adjusted for inflation, since 1900, the range of outcomes of losses since 1900 is 49 billion in 1900 and 48 billion in 2005. The worst performing year was 1926 in the Florida hurricane season of 114 billion. So this is truly random and it is not dependent on time. The second thing we hear is clients are concerned and wanna know more about liquidity. Well, in the quota shares and the non, uh, marketable securities, liquidity is thin. In fact, it's once a year when the contracts renew. But in the catastrophe bonds, the 144A securities, there are ample markets. And I use the corona crisis as an example of this, because as I mentioned, we hold two and a half to 5% of insurance link notes in our multi-sector strategies and scattered throughout our separate mandates. And ILS was the best source of liquidity to sell fixed income at its marked price on the day we offered it so that we could opportunistically trade in the portfolios 
to capture more upside in dislocated securities, and in some cases, deliver liquidity to clients that needed it. So in that uh, asset sector, you, you would be very big watchers of this uh, named storm debate and, and to uh, how many storms graduate to have a, to a, to have a name and, and then to make landfall. And I was interested in your point about uh, the, the loss statistics, because wouldn't it be that compared to 180 years ago, we, we, if one does make landfall these days, there's more for it to destroy. So wouldn't that play into the, the, the figures of loss? Well, I can tell you that our portfolio managers of the strategy have many, many, many sleepless nights. And that is one of the factors that concerns them is where will this storm make landfall? A huge storm can make landfall in an unpopulated, undeveloped area, and it's completely irrelevant to the experience. But a smaller storm can hit a densely populated area and it's a big problem. And this is the, the crux of our excellence in performance in this strategy. Um, we are able to use these models to understand the storm patterns and understand where we need more remote risk in the different types of peril and where we need to avoid and emphasize in terms of geography. So it's that level of diversification by geography, type of peril, and by counterparty that eliminate that risk as being um, uh, an all or none proposition. Excellent political summary, Christine, but uh, if we can divorce ourselves, it's, I know it's hard in, a, in an, an election year in the United States, particularly with the deadline tightening towards that, but if we could go back to the economic, and again, can't always um, strip that out from the political, but what are your expectations for spreads post the next US reporting season? Uh, Spreads have tightened considerably. And there's lots of concern that, that corporate bond spreads have gotten over their skis. In the high yield market, spreads have retraced 80% of their widening from end of February, end of March to today. Investment grade spreads have retraced 90% of their widening. Now I had mentioned uh, the opportunities in securitized credit, credit um, specifically the residential mortgage area. Those spreads have only retraced 12% of their widening. So compelling value there, especially when you consider housing prices, um, increased prepayment speeds, low loan to value, low delinquency rates. So lots of room to run on spreads in the securitized sectors. So now let's focus on corporate bond spreads and, and what that might be, you know, where that might be going. The bottom line is we think that corporate bond spreads are fair and they offer attractive relative value. We're fixed income managers and we buy fixed income securities. So we need to buy the cheapest ones. And you'd still call corporate bond, corporate credit among the relatively cheapest available securities in the market. And I'm basing that um, on pricing as well as steady results and a good outlook for corporate America. So if you look at the S&P companies through 2Q, 63% of them reported revenue growth that was higher than estimates and 84% beat their earnings estimates. So the corp corporate America is surprising to the upside. And if you look at company surveys, the, op the level of optimism is the highest since March. It's still below the beginning of the year or February, um, but the breadth of the momentum of these surveys is, is notable. Um, we th look at things like retail sales. Mm. 
steadily higher. The consumer drives 70% of the economy and corporate America benefits from a strong economy. Balance sheets are shored up. As I mentioned, issuance of, of corporate bonds has dwarfed what it was last year. And that has been for the purpose of refinancing and creating liquidity on the balance sheet. Corporate America has built in financial flexibility into their business models and can survive this. They're also doing an excellent job of cost cutting. And even if there has been some revenue destruction, however temporary, they're still able to maintain liquidity and margins. And finally, of course, the level of direct government support in the form of asset purchases and these lending programs, as well as fiscal policy, and that's fiscal policy, as well as monetary policy, keeping interest rates, real rates are negative. That's a boon for any borrower, any leveraged. So we're, we're feeling pretty comfortable about the outlook and think that there's not a terrible amount of spreads to be tightened in corporate America, but you can, you can be sure that that carry is going to be very valuable in your portfolio. You mentioned that um, strength of the consumer. So in, any company facing the consumer and particularly selling to them online is doing well, but what, what, what sectors do you feel are thriving and, and uh, post COVID and, and, and which have really sunk and flowing from that, the, the kind of employment outlook you see in the US? Uh, in terms of sectors, as you mentioned, retail, that has been hurt badly. But even in the strong sectors like technology, there's a common theme here. And that is this COVID crisis has driven a winner take all economy. When you look at retailers like Target, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, they are killing it when it comes to same store sales up 10 to 25 percent but their online experience is up 100 to 200 percent even their august sales after that period that was so scary at the end of june when virus cases spiked up and consumers withdrew those numbers are still growing in the low double digits now this is at the expense of the old line retailers that we have come so accustomed to expecting steadiness from, but didn't adapt like um, Brooks Brothers established in 1818, Lord and Taylor 1826, JC Penney and the list goes on. So obviously we've got Microsoft and Oracle looking at TikTok, we got Apple, et cetera. So it's a winner take all economy. And that factors into how we divide up the sectors in the market in terms of, as you say, impaired, unimpaired, and wounded. The wounded, of course, is the most interesting. Those are the sectors like leisure, gaming, anything in the travel area, autos, metals and chemicals, services, industrials, and all of these have pretty much touched financings in the area of fallen angels and rescue financings. There has been great opportunity as investors um, putting capital to work there. Now, the, the impaired is what you want to stay away from. And that would be in the energy sector, particularly exploration and production. We still believe that the midstreams have some value and belong in the wounded area. Retail, we believe, but for these winner-take-all victors, is in the permanently impaired category. Air travel, aerospace will probably never be the same. And then you have staples in the portfolio that are there for um, just the purpose of low volatility and income producing. And that would be like cable, utility, tech, healthcare, um, food and drug, and of course, one of the best performers of this whole crisis has been in the home builders area. So that's how we think about the sectors in the economy and divide them up in terms of opportunity and risk. 
again, um, looking away or, or focusing past the, the fact that there's an election coming and, and quite possibly a change of administration, how does 2021 look to you? I know that makes, um, it's difficult because it, we need to kind of prognosticate about what will happen in health. Will, will we have a vaccine or, mm -hmm. or will we have um, determined some kind of non-vaccine cocktail of treatment that can work, uh, inverted commas, for the time being? But so much of uh, economic health and animal spirits of, of consumption is tied up with that. I know it's difficult to predict, to predict but... At Adamundi, what, what are your views on 2021? Well, you really need to care about and monitor closely employment. Unless people are back to work, the economy is going to be crippled. And uh, we really are concentrating when we're, when we're trying to understand what the employment picture might look like in 2021. We're really looking specifically at the small business sector and at the state and local government level. We know that the employment picture is very, very damaged, but we also see signs that it's improving fairly dramatically. We're adding jobs and um, new claims are declining. And how, where are those new claims coming from and where are the new jobs coming from? Well, 50% of employment is in the small business sector. So here we're looking at um, the stability in that sector. And if it's stable, if it's growing, they are going to hire. And what is their current practice and how can we project that into the future? Well, they got a bridge to somewhere with the PPP and some of the other lending programs. And that has been a savior in terms of the employment picture and in terms of keeping these businesses open. We're seeing that new business applications are skyrocketing. As, as recently as three weeks ago, these numbers have started to really move up. So that's a very positive sign. That said, small businesses um, interviewed, there's an expectation that probably 13% of them will never reopen. And that number is probably growing. So we have to figure out whether these things offset each other. Um, new business openings are trending higher. Very importantly, new business optimism is at, 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 at very steep slope of improvement. And that's important because optimistic businesses invest and they hire people. Um, the Atlanta Fed is informing us that um, expectations um, for employment in the small business sector um, are, are trending up as per their survey. And the small business NFIB says that 18% of small businesses are in motion of hiring presently. All of these things give us optimism about the employment picture and therefore the economy in 2021. Still, there's uncertainty. 15% of small businesses say they're probably not going to hire back. They've figured out how to work with smaller staffs. And 36% say business conditions are good. Well, 36% is not a very good number to say that conditions are good. So we're, we're cautious but we are seeing um, survey movement and applications. So we're seeing real numbers reflect positive news on the small business hiring front. And then state and local government employment is 15% of the US economy. Now state and local governments have already shed a million and a half jobs. Keep in mind, that state and local governments are required by law to balance their budgets. And they're in an environment where expenses are going up, largely from the coronavirus and how to deal with that, but we also have some pretty serious social unrest and conflict here in many cities of the country. And revenues are going down. 
Revenues are going down because tax revenues are going down with less economic activity. Corporate tax revenues are down over 15%. Individual tax revenues are down over 10%. Sales tax revenues are actually flat, so that's a good sign. But really importantly too, the fee revenues are down. Even fee revenues for essential services like transit, hospitals, um, electricity when it comes to um, uh, corporate facilities in the cities, but actually suburban electricity revenues are going up. So there's some evidence of, of mixture there, but the transit revenues are really getting hammered. For example, the New York MTA, which is the biggest transit system in the country, revenues are down 75%. So we are cautiously optimistic that we will have um, new jobs created, that that pattern will continue, that layoffs will abate because of the strength in the small business sector and because we believe that state and local governments will get some level of support. The support that they've been given hasn't been used in the form of borrowing or in the form of um, outright grants. So there's some room there. And we have a stimulus package that's being negotiated as we speak uh, in Congress that is likely to include that. So there's some floor there. And finally, we're looking at the mobility data. Mobility is directly correlated with retail sales and small business employment. These, these line charts are right on top of each other. And the mobility trends in the high frequency data are positive. Retail and recreation, which I just said, directly correlated with consumer spending, trending up. It's plateaued a bit since the June spike in coronavirus, but it is, it is favoring up even in the last week or two. Hotel occupancy was devastated during the height of the crisis. And now we're at levels in many hotels that is above break even. We're at 50, 60% occupancy. And a lot of this is in the low level type hotels, not yet, we're not yet seeing this in the luxury, but it's the low level hotels that are, are, that are most representative of re-entry. Restaurant billings, Open Table and Google and other sources tell us that people are going out to eat. They pulled back from the specific regions that experienced the spikes, but elsewhere you're seeing activity in this area. And finally, we're even seeing increased activity in TSA uh, screens. So more people are flying, although again, this is terribly dislocated in that region. And as I mentioned, we consider this sort of a, a permanently changed industry. We've seen in the Western liberal democracies, uh, the, the Brexit, um, Trump, uh, even the UK election a bit, certainly the Australian election. We've seen polling really struggling with the reticence of, um, of conservative voters. They, they don't seem to want to admit to, to, they don't trust pollsters enough to tell them their intentions. And that polling industry is in big, big strife if, if Trump gets up because yep. in, in the UK, they call it the shy Tories phenomenon that, that, the Tories on the doorstep will not say they are Tories. They, they don't feel that they want to say it. They, they won't answer pollsters that way. And it, as I said, in, in some of these uh, Western countries, the, the, the pollsters are going about 0 for 5 in recent elections and referendums. And that I think is going to be really interesting, whether, whether again, they are, structurally overstating the democratic vote? Well, I think that's very true. I think it's, uh, the, the shyness is even more exaggerated and pronounced because of the personalities that we're talking about. It's hard to admit that you're supporting um, the behavior of Donald Trump. You, yes. you might vote for his policies, et cetera, but there's a lot of behavior that's, that's unbecoming. Yes. And it's hard to say and admit, you know, in the quiet of a poll booth, you can fill in the black mark, but you may not want to yes. let another human being face to face know that that's true. 
Um, that's why we really look at the online betting sites yes. as a better indicator. Um, and they are favoring Biden. But as I said, there's a lot of vulnerability in the outcome because of the lack of real fundamental stability in the Biden voter base. Mm. I try to be the intellectual conscience of my children and my daughter, my daughter was sending out, sharing the Michelle Obama speech and, and just loving it. And I said to her, but Eliza, it's classic Democrat. It's saying, we know you voted for us. Uh, I'm sorry. We know you voted against us last time because you're stupid and you're gullible and, and you didn't understand it, but we understand that and come back and we forgive you. And I said, it's just, I said to her, it's classic. They ne they've never said, um, here's why we hope we can win you back. Here's what we've tried to do to win back your trust. But we will see. I think there's a general lack of accountability in US politics. I think that would be, if there's one thing I could change, um, that would be it. And I think what you just said is representative of that. A complete lack of accountability of mistakes made and how you are to improve it. And, and this is why no decent person, or not decent, like, um, it's very hard to find a person with a checked ego that will go for that job hmm. because they, they are accountable. Mm -hmm. And I thought you, you, you want to attack the president for moral failings and, and you have Bill speaking. That, but I mean, look, our, our election last May, Christine, was all the things you mentioned, betting, polls, etc. It was astonishing on the day that this incredible sense of the silent majority, whether yes. you liked it or not, whether you liked it or not, people who don't speak, don't tweet, but on a, on a certain day, they get to go into a booth and they speak. I think that's brilliant. And I think that's the thing that the market is um, factoring in to the high valuations. I think the market is saying, we aren't gonna get um, negative tax policy regulation. We're gonna have status quo. That's what I think. It will be amazing. Amazing. It will be amazing. Mm. I, I mean, I can't tell you how shocked I was when I looked at my phone in the middle of the night on election day and saw that Donald Trump had won. So, oh, I mean, yeah. Yes, well, we had a um, similar thing last May. Thank you so much, Christine. I could have gone on all day, but you've got- Same nice here. I, I really, really appreciate it.